Welcome to today's session titled, Is the Campus Community Book Project Constitutional? Featuring School of Law Professor and Chancellor's Fellow Brian Socek, presented by the UC Davis Campus Community Book Project. My name is Megan Macklin, and I serve as a program manager in the Office of Campus Community Relations at UC Davis, where I manage the book project. Thank you for joining. To begin, a couple of housekeeping items for our virtual event. Today's event features live captioning from Otter Live Notes. To access the transcript, click on the red live icon on the top left of your Zoom screen. You also can access the live stream by navigating to the link that we'll put in chat. Today's session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Book Project website. We also encourage you to turn on your video. It's great, especially for our speaker to see faces. And you are invited to ask questions or share comments in the chat at any point during the event. The Campus Community Book Project promotes dialogue and builds community by encouraging diverse members of the campus and surrounding communities to read the same book and attend related events. The Book Project, a signature initiative out of the Office of Campus Community Relations since 2002, advances the mission to improve both the campus climate and community relations, to foster diversity and to promote equity and inclusiveness. Currently in its 20th year, the book project in 2021-2022 focuses on the theme of social justice in practice and features How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Our theme and selection are supported by a year-long program of lectures, workshops, book discussions, film screenings, exhibits, performances, and more. Our program culminates when author Ibram X. Kendi comes to UC Davis on Thursday, March 31, 2022, to speak at the Mandavi Center for the Performing Arts. For more information about the Book Project program, please visit our website where you can find up-to-date event information, registration links, and other resources. We also welcome your involvement, students, staff, faculty, and community members, in selecting the Book Project feature title and in planning our annual program. If you are interested in getting involved with the book project, please send us an email or refer to the book project website for more information. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Brian Socek is a professor and chancellor's fellow at the UC Davis School of Law, which he joined in 2013. He holds a PhD in philosophy from Columbia University and a JD from Yale Law School, where he was Commons editor for the Yale Law Journal, a Coker Fellow in Procedure, and won the Munson Prize for his work in the school's immigration clinic. Prior to law school, Professor Socek taught at the University of Chicago in the Humanities Collegiate Division and Philosophy Department. After law school, he clerked for the late Mark R. Kravitz, United States District Judge for the District of Connecticut, and the Honorable Guido Calabresi of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Professor Socek's work has been cited by the U.S. Supreme Court and the Sixth and Seventh Circuits, referenced and excerpt in leading case books in immigration law, civil procedure, and sexual orientation law, discussed by the Wall Street Journal, and honored with the Duke Minier Award uh, from UCLA's Williams Institute for the year's best article on sexual orientation and gender identity law. Professor Cho Socek's published work spans from constitutional and statutory anti-discrimination law to refugee slash asylum law to research at the intersection of law and aesthetics. In 2020-2021 alone, Professor Socek served as chair of the University of California's system-wide committee on academic freedom, a fellow with the University of California National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement, and a trustee of the American Society for Aesthetics. Professor Socek, thank you so much for joining us today and please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Let me share a screen. So good, but I can still see people. Terrific. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining me. So is the Campus Community Book Project constitutional? Uh, the question almost seems like a joke. Of course, the Campus Community Book Project is constitutional. Why would I have shown up otherwise? How could it be possible uh, that something the university does or perhaps an office within the university does, and more on that distinction, much more in a minute, uh, could be unconstitutional simply because they're assigning a book to read, uh, much less just suggesting a book that people might want to voluntarily read on their own. We might as well ask whether a class syllabus could include a reading list. Why would anyone think to ask this question? Uh, well, let me suggest a possibility, and it's one that's lifted from the Campus Community Book Project's own website. The project's director, uh, Megan Macklin, who has been so kind and generous in inviting me to give this talk today, uh, says there that with Kendi's book, we will work beyond spaces of neutrality and complicity and strive for action to reframe our policies and practices and our racial consciousness. Further down the same webpage, Vice Chancellor Tull says that 
Bringing Dr. Kendi to campus, quote, affirms our commitment to advancing, operationalizing, and institutionalizing anti-racism at UC Davis. Macklin's call to move, quote, beyond spaces of neutrality will surely be a trigger for those who see universities as one of our society's most necessary and paradigmatic spaces of neutrality. The quote, home and sponsor of political, social, and moral debates and commitments, not a proper holder of such commitments itself. According to this view, one that's especially uh, associated with the University of Chicago, uh, institutionalizing anti-racism at UC Davis, to quote Vice Chancellor Tulligan, means abandoning the institutional neutrality that freedom of inquiry is said to require. So to quote what's probably the most famous statement of this pro-neutrality view, which is the University of Chicago's 1967 Calvin Committee statement, the university is not a club, it's not a lobby. The university is a community only for the limited, albeit great purposes of teaching and research. It's a community which cannot take collective action on the issues of the day without endangering the conditions for its existence and effectiveness. There's no mechanism by which it can reach a collective position without inhibiting that full freedom of dissent on which it thrives. If it takes collective action, it does so at the price of censuring any minority who do not agree with the view adopted. Now, I don't myself agree with much of this. Uh, in particular, I don't think that an institution that takes a position or action necessarily thereby censures any dissenting minorities within the institution. I've disagreed vehemently with any number of institutions of which I've been a part, from the church I grew up with to the professional society of which, as we just heard, I'm now a trustee, without ever feeling much less being censured by them. But put my objection aside for just a moment. The general thrust of the famous Calvin Committee report is that the university must remain neutral precisely so that its constituents are free to take positions. So now go back to the Campus Community Book Project's website. Go back to its claims that with this year's books, we will work beyond spaces of neutrality, or its assertion that our commitment to institutionalizing anti-racism at UC Davis will be furthered by, this, uh, by the author's visit. A lot turns there on who is we and what counts as ours. Now, in the Chicago view, there's a huge difference between UC Davis trying to reframe its racial consciousness or UC Davis affirming a commitment to anti-racism and say me or you doing so. Uh, on Chicago's view, Davis isn't supposed to work beyond spaces of neutrality. It's supposed to be a space of neutrality. It's those within the university that are supposed to, if we want, move beyond neutrality to advocate for policies and seek justice and maybe reframe our racial consciousness without fear of institutional censure. The Chicago View treats the institution and the people within it categorically differently. And it sees academic freedom, which is the lifeblood of the university, as dependent on this distinction. Institutional neutrality is what's said to liberate academics to follow their expertise wherever it leads. At a public institution like UC Davis, academic freedom is at once a core institutional value, it's a contractual guarantee, and it's also a constitutional right, a constitutional right protected if uh, somewhat uncertainly at the margins by the First Amendment. So now perhaps we can see how some might question the constitutionality of the Campus Community Book Project. The constitutional threat, though, requires us to see the project, not just the choice of books, but the official rhetoric surrounding the choice, as an expression attributed to UC Davis. As if this was a project arising from within, say, a faculty reading group, no one would attribute any of the group's choices or speech to Davis. We would then be exercising academic freedom, not potentially jeopardizing it. So much might turn on how we characterize the book project itself. Now. If you actually reject the Chicago insistence on institutional neutrality, as I largely do, you still might care about whether the book project is speaking for the university. In fact, you might care even more. For if we're going to allow or even encourage the university to make statements, something that I myself have successfully done in the past, we're gonna to need to think really carefully about how those statements get made and by whom. 
who gets to declare what commitments we're expressing, much less operationalizing as a campus? And what limits are there, if any, on the commitments we or the campus are able to make? These are the kinds of questions that I wanna talk about here today. So let's take the example with which I began, the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion announcing the selection of the Campus Community Book Project and touting it as one means of advancing, operationalizing and institutionalizing anti-racism at UC Davis. Vice Chancellor Tall is surely deputized to speak for UC Davis, at least on issues surrounding diversity, equity and inclusion. Should those uh, with positions above her feel that she has misspoken? Nobody, nothing corrects, nothing uh, prevents them from correcting the mistake. The vice chancellor's statement is not protected by academic freedom since she's not engaged in teaching research or the public dissemination of knowledge or by the first amendment since she's a government employee speaking in the course of her employment. What that means is that the vice chancellor could be removed should those above her dislike how she is speaking for the university or disagree with what she's operationalizing and institutionalizing. Both the authority and the lines of accountability are clear when it comes to the vice chancellor's speech on behalf of UC Davis. Now we might, and I later will, ask if an institutional commitment to anti-racism is itself constitutional, uh, but that's a separate question. Now, at the other end of the spectrum from the vice chancellor, I hope it's clear that everything I say here is protected both by academic freedom and the First Amendment. I'm speaking only for myself, that should be clear. Uh, I'm doing so on a matter about which I have disciplinary expertise. And although I too am a state employee, academics are not seen at least by the Ninth Circuit, the Court of Appeals uh, where we're located, as having bosses in quite the same sense as other state employees. So the really hard question exists not on either extreme, the vice chancellor and me, uh, but in between the two poles I've just described. I'm talking here primarily about speech by departments or schools, units within the university, which is the source of some significant recent controversy across UC's campuses, ours included. It's here we find in what I think are their toughest form, uh, the main questions that I've been wanting to address here. Whose speech is it? If it's institutional speech, is it authorized? And is the message itself a permissible one? Now, as I hope will become clear, I think departmental speech is far more common and far more widely accepted and in fact expected than most seem to realize. So by providing any of the examples that follow, my goal certainly isn't to criticize any particular department or any speech act at UC Davis or elsewhere. My goal is a different one. I think looking at the variety of specific ways that departments speak allow us to perhaps better understand the varied considerations we all might take into account when crafting, calling for, or joining these kinds of statements in the future. So at the present moment, a whole lot of protests and discussions and working groups and legal consultations at the University of California have been happening because of statements on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, some of which were made earlier this year. One public statement of solidarity with the people of Palestine was signed by almost every gender studies department in the country, ours included. Several other departments and programs here at David crafted their own similar statement of solidarity. Notably, their statement, this latter one, uh, includes details of Davis students who are personally affected by the conflict. It calls for specific changes in the Biden administration's support and funding for Israel. And somewhat curiously, it, the statement's signatories include both departments, research, research initiatives, and a program, but also over 50 individual faculty members, some of which are and others aren't members of those departments, which themselves purportedly signed. In response to these statements, another group of faculty members, ones not tied to any particular department, uh, has protested to campus council and many others that the solidarity statements are quote, blatant political advocacy and admits use of state funded University of California resources. The critics point to section 92,000 of the California Education Code 
which prohibits use of UC's name in support of any, quote, political, religious, sociological, or economic movement activity or program. These critics worry about the chilling effect on faculty and students who may disagree with departmental statements, such as the one I showed. Academic freedom is endangered, they argue, when departments make certain political positions orthodox. These critics ask how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict falls within the expertise of certain of the departments that signed on to the statement. They allege that the statements may create a hostile environment for Jewish students. And they call on the university to develop policies to regulate these kinds of departmental statements and, and endorsements in the future. Efforts to do this, or at least discussions of whether to do this, are in fact going on both at the campus and the system-wide level. What such a policy should look like, though, is an incredibly hard question. It's easy to say that departments should just get out of the business of weighing in on world events, but this would actually be an enormous change to our current practice. Scroll through the websites of our departments here at Davis and just see how many include statements right at the top of the homepage, uh, addressing racial justice, Black Lives Matter, the killing of George Floyd, violence against Asian Americans, and the anniversary of 9-11. My own unit, the School of Law, has posted statements from our dean offering thoughts on critical race theory, the military's refusal under the Trump administration to hire transgender troops, the January 6th riots at the Capitol, as well as multiple messages about racial justice and police violence. Some of these are phrased as statements from my dean. Others are said to be stating positions explicitly held by the school of law. And this is one of the most basic ways department statements tend to differ. Some are signed by the department itself. So the UC Davis School of Law strongly opposes the decision to discriminate against transgender soldiers, or the UC Davis Department of Philosophy condemns the anti-Asian -race, anti racism and violence that have afflicted our state and country in recent months. Other times, deans and chairs write in their own name, either in their personal capacity or more relevantly to what I'm talking about here, speaking on behalf of the unit they lead. Uh, another type of message comes from the faculty or the faculty and staff, or even the faculty, staff, and students of a particular department. In some cases, there's more of a hybrid and the precise speaker becomes a bit unclear. Uh, when a statement says the faculty and staff of department X condemn such and such, but then includes signatures of individuals at the bottom of the statement, it seems the statement presumably comes from the individuals, not the faculty as a whole. Other statements make this more clear by saying the undersigned faculty of Department X. Here's an example from a department chair signing a statement personally, but speaking throughout about what we are committed to doing and affirming, quote, the support of the political science faculty, staff, and graduate students for our Black students, staff, and faculty colleagues. The chair here is apparently speaking not just for the department as institutional entity, but for the people that comprise it as well. Each of these paths uh, has its own issues, frankly. Start with the statement that comes from or is signed by the department itself. This is the only case where state law and university policies about the use of the university's name really come into play. For after all, it's here that say the UC Davis School of Law or some other such entity is the one doing the talking. We might ask, what's the difference between all the members of a department signing something versus the department itself signing? The answer surely has to have something to do with leveraging the department's name, its prestige or its reputation. When a unit of the school invites a speaker for commencement or to give an endowed lecture, the unit is saying something, it's bestowing an honor. That of course doesn't mean that every member of the department or school agrees with the decision about whom to honor. Uh, one of the judges that I clerked for, Megan mentioned, uh, Guido Calabresi, when he was the Dean of Yale Law School had allowed a controversial speaker uh, to come give a talk at the school, but then joined the speaker, joined the students and others outside the hall, protesting, marching back and forth with signs to protest the very speaker he had allowed to come. In this, I think departmental expression is little different than many other departmental activities. 
deciding what requirements there should be for a major, for example. I might wish students could take more or fewer electives, and that's fine because everyone knows the rules are the departments, not necessarily mine. So too with departmental statements, they can't be automatically ascribed to all of the department's individual members. So what about statements from the chair or dean? Well, even when the chair or dean is speaking on behalf of their unit, statements made in their voice have one big advantage over statements signed by the department itself, and that's accountability. Academic freedom does not protect a dean or chair from repercussions for the things that they do as dean or chair. Now, I want to acknowledge what I just said is a little controversial. The Canadian Association of University Teachers, for example, feels otherwise and uh, recently released a big statement about uh, a controversy around a unit head at McGill University. Here at the University of California, however, UC's Academic Personnel Manual, the newly added APM 011, for example, clearly carves out activities done pursuant to administrative roles from the academic freedom protections, it otherwise extended more broadly to academic appointees. A chair has academic freedom protections as a faculty member, not as chair. That means that if the chair or dean speaks for their unit in a way that's at odds with the university's own message, the chair or dean can be replaced. A department in school presumably can't be. Because deans and chairs automatically have authority to speak for their unit, their official statements have another related advantage. There's no ambiguity about whether a statement by the department implies the dissent of any of its particular members. When a department makes or signs a statement, readers may wonder how the decision to do so was reached. Did all have to consent? Maybe just a majority? Who knows? Letting the dean or chair speak avoids this ambiguity. Now to this, you might say, well, we should change this. Departments should just have more transparent procedures in place to make or approve uh, departmental statements. And there's much to be said for that, but I would caution that holding unit-wide votes about statements on potentially contentious issues may actually exacerbate the sort of academic freedom violating chilling effect that critics of such statements are expressing worries about. Letting the dean or chair speak for the unit, by contrast, has the virtue of not forcing individual faculty to take a position on each of these issues. And that brings us to issues surrounding statements by groups of individually named members of a department or school. On the one hand, this is a much simpler, clearer cut uh, situation from a legal perspective. Faculty obviously have academic freedom protections and general First Amendment protections to make or sign most any political statement they want. By contrast, I've just said deans and chairs don't have such protections when speaking as deans and chairs. So a statement from a group of faculty within a given unit, or if all are unanimous, a statement signed by the faculty of the UC Davis Department of such and such is going to be on pretty constitutionally solid ground. But importantly, that doesn't mean that statements in this form are the least likely to have the kinds of chilling effects that critics worry about. Consider a statement against racism made last year at Penn State Law School and School of International Affairs. The school's dean wrote to the community to say that it is, quote, critical to be on record condemning racist violence, police brutality, and systemic racism against black men and women. She, the dean, urged students, faculty, staff, and alumni to publicly sign the open letter, just as she said she had done. Now, Brian Leiter, a philosopher and law professor at the University of Chicago and a prominent commentator on law school affairs, described the dean's call to sign the statement as, quote, a serious violation of academic freedom. The dean of a law school, he said, should not be proclaiming the correct interpretation of public events, e.g., that this killing reflected racism or was connected to something called, quote, systemic racism, let alone using her position to solicit support for her interpretation. Now, as I've already indicated, I hardly think it's a serious violation of academic freedom for a dean to offer an opinionated statement on public events. I actually think it treats faculty like snowflakes 
to think that a stated institutional position on a public issue will automatically serve to stifle dissenting views from within the institution. That said, when your dean urges you to sign something and is making public the names of everyone who does, and by implication, of course, everyone who doesn't, the pressure to comply does strike me as real. Ironically then, the type of statement that's most strongly protected legally, statements signed by individual faculty members, can also in some cases present one of the strongest threats to the academic freedom of those who would prefer not to sign. By contrast, statements made by the unit or its leader often allow individual faculty to keep their potentially unpopular views to themselves. One other consideration about this is worth mentioning. There are times when a unit within a university might post a statement made by some of its members on the department website. That's fine, but then they should be aware that this likely opens the unit to a requirement that any other statements by unit members be given the same treatment. Unless the department or school or its leader endorses the initial statement as its own, the unit hasn't itself spoken by putting the statement on its website. What it's done instead is to open up what we lawyers refer to as a limited public forum. And within those, viewpoint discrimination is constitutionally prohibited. The unit won't be able to pick and choose, in other words, what to publicize on its website in terms of statements from faculty. Now, the considerations I've just canvassed all speak to who should be doing the expressing when it comes to departmental statements. Individuals within the department, the department's leader, or the department itself. There are times, especially on matters of university governance, where I think we want to hear departments' positions on a given topic. But otherwise, unless departments have clear procedures for formulating collective statements, statements from the chair or dean on behalf of their department probably allow for clearer lines of responsibility. Now there is a separate and equally or more important question about not who should be allowed to speak, but what they should or may speak about. Now there's one clear rule uh, that's been repeated in university policies for decades, sorry, wrong slide. Uh, and that's the university's name and resources cannot be used for electioneering and other political purposes. Now, what counts as political isn't self-defining, of course, expressing, uh, no, still wrong slide, expressing support for Black Lives Matter is certainly political in one standard sense. So too is taking a position on DACA or vaccinations or the value of diversity. But the University of California has standardly interpreted political purposes to mean activity related to campaigns for public office or ballot initiatives. So statements endorsing a political candidate are clearly not allowed. The question is whether there are any other limits or whether there should be. And I wanna reemphasize that these limits might best be self-imposed. They don't necessarily have to be rules policed by the university. So we could just as well think of the considerations that follow as questions a dean or chair or a group of faculty members might ask themselves before calling for or signing on to any particular statement. The first I'd say is to ask uh, whether the statement is internally or externally focused. And this of course is a sliding scale. I mean, statements made in the wake of George Floyd's murder were obviously focused in significant part on race and issues of race and policing in Minnesota and across the country. But many of them also focused on ways that members of our own community were affected and hurting. Some addressed policing issues locally, including here at Davis. Many talked about the effects of systemic racism within that unit, its curriculum, or its field. See, for example, this example from the Classics Department, expressing the department's solidarity with Black Lives Matter, but also calling out its own disciplines, quote, historic and continued complicity with racist narratives. I think the general rule has to be that a department is always within its rights to issue statements regarding their own operations and internal affairs. Or put a different way, if a department is able to act a certain way, it can certainly issue statements talking about how it plans to act. Now in this regard, consider an example that happened again at the University of Chicago that recently got a lot of public attention. 
the English department's statement of support for Black Lives Matter in 2020, uh, they issued as part of that statement of support, a statement saying that the department would be quote, prioritizing consideration of applicants who work in and with black studies for admission to its PhD program in the 2020-2021 admission cycle. Some commentators were outraged at what they saw as a political test for admissions, content discrimination to be sure, if not actually viewpoint discrimination. But Chicago's president, while noting that his school's stance on institutional neutrality applies to departments no less than the university itself, observed that the English department statement could be read either as a political test or as quote, the natural exercise of the prerogatives of an academic department to make decisions about the choice of scholarly directions it wants to emphasize in its educational and research programs. This he added would be quote, an important manifestation of academic freedom, not a threat to it. I think President Zimmer's statement is absolutely correct. Fundamental principles of academic freedom tell us that disciplinary experts in a given field should have the primary authority to decide both what and whom to teach. Curricular and admissions decisions are generally the responsibility of the department's faculty, which can decide what parts of their field deserve greater attention. But there are limits, of course. Political litmus tests would be one uh, such limit, certainly here at the University of California, where Regents bylaw says that no political test shall ever be considered in the appointment or promotion of any faculty member or employee. So if Chicago's English department means to apply a political test, it's presumably acting beyond its powers. If it's emphasizing a particular set of interests within its field, by contrast, then it's acting entirely as departments should. And in that regard, I just note that in this year's admission cycle, the Chicago English department is prioritizing Anglophone writing from the medieval period up to 1900. Unlike the previous year's statements, this year's priority doesn't seem to have made Fox News. The point here is that there are a lot of ways a unit of a university might respond to an event in the world. It could beef up counseling services, institute a new lecture series as my school did. It could re-examine its curriculum or its hiring or admissions priorities. And if it chooses to do these things in response to events in the world, the unit can surely issue a statement in the unit's name explaining what and why it is doing what it has chosen to do. Of course, some within the unit might again disagree with the chosen course of action, but departmental statements of this kind, non-neutral as they are, need to be seen as an exercise of academic freedom, not a threat to it. The contrast case are statements focused primarily on the world outside the department. These frankly are the more fraught types of statement. And here I think some other additional considerations may need to be taken into account. One thing to consider is whether the statement is on a topic that falls within the department's distinct disciplinary expertise. And two points are important here. First, departmental expertise is something different than expertise some within the department might have. I have colleagues who are deeply knowledgeable about Middle Eastern politics, but the majority of us on the law faculty have just an average educated person's knowledge of Middle Eastern affairs. So what does fall within, let's say the School of Law's distinct disciplinary expertise? I would say issues surrounding the rule of law, the makeup and operations of our courts, rights guaranteed under the US Constitution, and certainly access to justice issues. Are these lines blurry? Of course. I could possibly imagine the School of Law expressing concern about the Senate's failure to consider a president's nominee to the US Supreme Court. By contrast, statements about the moral fitness of a particular nominee to serve on that court goes beyond what I see as our collective expertise. The law reaches most every aspect of human life, but that doesn't mean that a law school has expertise and license to issue statements on everything in life that the law touches. And this suggests a second point about expertise, namely that a lot hinges on the level of generality at which a discipline's expertise is described. The faculties of any number of departments study power and systems of oppression. And because oppression often operates intersectionally, it may not be possible to cabin the study of oppression into discrete categories gender over here, national origin or race over there. 
Perhaps injustice anywhere truly is a threat to injustice everywhere. But the question is, does this give certain departments free reign to weigh in on any and all of the world's injustices? Were that the consequence, I think we might have defined the department's distinctive competencies, their reason for existence, if you will, at too high a level of generality. The final consideration I wanna raise, and one that cuts across both internally and externally focused statements, is the level of specificity with which a department responds to events in the world. And danger lurks on either side here. Banal generalities about how protests against racial violence, quote, remind us, all of us, that we need to do better or reinforce our commitment to working against systemic racism, those kinds of statements are unlikely to satisfy, much less help anyone. But on the other side, calls for specific changes in public spending or the passage of particular bills, these are far less likely to fall within the distinctive disciplinary competence of most departments. And they're far more likely to appeal, appear impermissibly partisan. Again, no clear lines here. Uh, the fact that some now dispute the science behind COVID vaccines doesn't make that an impermissibly partisan topic for departments with the requisite experience to make statements about. One rule of thumb, I think, is that if there are different ways to address or advance a given issue, it's unlikely to be political in the prohibited sense. So for example, gender studies is something that can be approached in infinitely many ways. Feminism is a step more substantively specific, though of course the varieties of feminisms suggest that this is still clearly open-ended enough that a quote, curriculum that places feminist concerns within a transnational context, as does our Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies, should hardly raise any alarms. On the other hand, some recent public statements uh, have said that Zionism and feminism are incompatible. Now that's a far thicker, uh, there's a far thicker political specificity to this claim than say, just the notion that a department is founded on the understanding that the social production of gender is inseparable from other categories of difference. In a moment, I'll circle back to a similar spectrum of specificity involving racial justice, the topic of the book project. Okay, this has been a deep dive, I realize, into the complexity of expression by units within a, a university. So let me just sum up the issue this way. Academic freedom at its root is the idea that choices about how a department should pursue its mission is normally to be judged by the disciplinary standards recognized by experts within that department, not by administrators or the regents or the legislature or donors or the general public. So all of the fuzzy considerations that I've just canvassed, these are considerations that should in the first instance surely be left to departments to make. I'm pessimistic about the potential for general rules enforced from above here. But at the same time, decisions like these are entrusted to units within the university precisely because of their disciplinary expertise, their distinct disciplinary expertise. And that itself suggests a limit on the kind of expression departments should probably be engaged in. A department that found it could speak on most anything, a department that found it could speak on most anything would be one that thereby undermined the very basis for its having the academic freedom to speak in the first place. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, I came to hear whether the Campus Community Book Project is unconstitutional. What do the complexities of departmental expression on a university campus have to do with that? Well, if you can, recall why anyone might have thought the Campus Community Book Project was even potentially unconstitutional. It wasn't just because the campus was picking a book to the exclusion of other books. There are spaces on a public campus like ours where the First Amendment requires content and viewpoint neutrality. We don't get to pick and choose who can speak on a quad or what speakers student organizations are allowed to invite. But there are many other spaces where neutrality is decidedly not a constitutional requirement. The Mandavi Center or the Manet Shrem Museum don't have to be equal opportunity presenters of art open to all comers. They're curators of the content they present. The university similarly curates when it invites speakers from our commencement speakers uh, up top, all the way down, I suppose, to me here today. 
And the university or its Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion is engaged in content and viewpoint sensitive curation. I think we could go ahead and say content and viewpoint discrimination when it picks its annual community book. And that's fine. That's their job as curators. The concern arose from the universities or perhaps the DEI offices, we statements about anti-racism. The official affirmation of our commitment to advancing, operationalizing and institutionalizing anti-racism at UC Davis. Now, I don't know exactly who the book project is speaking for, but I do know that a significant number of units within this university and elsewhere have explicitly come out as sharing this commitment to anti-racism. Take for example, this website developed by a uh, formidable group of law school deans hosted by the Association of American Law Schools and dedicated to collecting resources, including institutional statements about becoming an anti-racist law school. My hope is that the discussion that we just had about departments taking positions and making statements might help us see first why some have questioned whether becoming an anti-racist school is an appropriate goal. And second, what responses to those questions or objections might look like. So for the critique, here's Brian Leiter again, this time commenting on columns from the president of the Association of American Law Schools, where she'd argued that, quote, we must work to transform our schools into anti-racist organizations. To that, Professor Leiter replied, quote, the idea that law schools should be transformed into anti-racist institutions as distinct from being non-racist ones that comply with equal opportunity laws would portend a massive violation of academic freedom of all faculty, just as transforming schools into anti-communist or anti-capitalist institutions would. Law schools, he says, exist to train lawyers and produce knowledge about the law, not to promote extraneous social goals even meritorious ones. Now, it is true, if we return to the considerations just canvassed, that compared to somewhat gauzy claims about advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion, which could mean many different things, transforming our schools into anti-racist organizations is a far more specific or thickly described political project. As how to be an anti-racist teaches, Anti-racism is a specific cluster of beliefs. Just look at the definitions that begin literally every chapter of the book. Anti-racism is a specific program for dismantling racial hierarchies, for challenging power and policies that allow racial inequities to persist. Anti-racism isn't explicitly partisan, I don't think, though I think it's fair to say that one current party shares more of its worldview than the other but it certainly is a richly described interlocking network of beliefs about, for example, race, ethnicity, biology, culture, and class. So does the specificity of the position being taken on a politically contentious issue mean that schools are wrong, or in Leiter's words, schools are causing a massive violation of academic freedom if they take and express the position that their schools should become anti-racist institutions. Well, some of the other considerations I can just canvassed uh, lead me to say, not so fast. Consider, for example, whether schools expressing their support for anti-racist policies are focused internally, or if they're commenting on political issues out in the world beyond. I mean, in theory, they could be doing either. They're certainly endorsing a conception of racial justice that extends far beyond their walls. But they're also surely talking about policies that the school itself has or will put into place. Policies that will either exacerbate or maintain or reduce racial inequalities at that school. To say, as Professor Leiter did, that law schools, quote, exist to train lawyers and produce knowledge about the law seems to me to uh, beg the relevant question. It assumes rather than argues that anti-racist policies are extraneous social goals rather than choices internal to the training of lawyers and the production of legal knowledge. Some policies I would think might lead to a different set of people getting trained at lawyers, as lawyers at my school. 
And of course, no law school does it all. So decisions always have to be made about what knowledge about the law a school is going to focus on producing. I don't see these choices as extraneous to the law school's mission, nor are they uh, necessarily avoidable ones. Leiter distinguishes non-racist institutions that comply with equal opportunity laws from anti-racist institutions that work to dismantle racial inequalities. Dr. Kendi would distinguish these two things as well. But that's because the central thesis of Dr. Kendi's book is that the category non-racist does not exist. Policies and the people and institutions who promote them, he says, are either anti-racist or they're racist. That's Kendi's argument. So Leiter's position, the supposedly neutral stance he claims is necessary to protect academic freedom, is thus every bit as much a rejection of Kendi's view as Professor Kendi's is of Leiter's. Why then is it not a political statement, much less a massive violation of academic freedom for institutions to adopt Leiter's position, thereby rejecting Kendi's? When it comes, say, to recruitment and student support, the choice between colorblind practices and anti-racist practices seems to be an unavoidable choice. Schools simply must follow one path or the other. I don't know where the place of neutrality even is there. Where I am more sympathetic to Professor Leiter's objection, the worry that an institutional commitment to anti-racism will impact academic freedom, is in its concern that institutions that take a strong stance will thereby prevent members of those institutions from dissenting. I get it. An institution that adopts and expresses certain values is naturally going to want its faculty to get on board and help advance those values. Where then is space for dissent? Won't the school or department reward only or primarily those who tow the company line? The worry is certainly real. But I think that outside the fraught context of race, we have plenty of examples where departments and their members have long navigated this sort of dynamic. Take teaching. There's nothing inconsistent about, on the one hand, requiring faculty to meet institutional teaching goals and to report their success at doing so. Even, on the other hand, while allowing them the freedom to speak out at faculty meetings, in the faculty senate, or even in the press, about how, say, UC focuses too much on teaching at the expense of research. Academic freedom means that faculty who seek to change institutional practices, institutional priorities, have to be protected from retaliation. Shared governance depends on protecting opportunities for dissent. But until dissenters persuade the institution to change course, they still have to do their job. That's basically how I see the constitutionality of our institutions and some of its units, commitments to anti-racism. The fact that I support it personally is neither here nor there. What matters is that those who disagree with me and their institution are given the space to tell us why we are wrong. The neutrality hawks think that institutional expression necessarily endangers academic freedom. I think it's the other way around, that a robust commitment to academic freedom is what enables institutions, gives them the permission, and gives the per permission to their constituent parts as well, as we've seen at some length here today, to take and express positions on the issues that matter to the institutions and the people that depend on them. My confidence in the University of California's protection of academic freedom is what gives me confidence that the Campus Community Book Project and the anti-racist project that it's promoting this year through the book project can indeed be defended as constitutional. Thanks so much for coming today and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you so much, Professor Socek. Really fascinating talk. I think I'm, I'm gonna be stunned for a couple of minutes and just need to gather my thoughts. Um, so welcome, um, any questions from our audience, um, you're free to raise your hand, put questions or comments into the chat and we've also allowed folks the ability to unmute themselves. And I do see we have a hand raised um, from Robert May. Robert, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Brian, for a really fascinating and, and profound and deep talk. Um, I think one thing that you really um, emphasize that I think is very important is a distinction between uh, the department as an administrative unit 
and faculty um, who are not, who are, have a different role and are governed by different rules and principles, and particularly the faculty code of conduct. And the difficulty in distinguishing, you know, things and statements and speech are made by faculty, in virtue of being a faculty member, as opposed to a department, which is an administrative unit, and hence is in some sense speaking for the university. And I think your emphasis on this is very important. And I think very few faculty actually understand this distinction, right? And, and, and a lot of the statements you showed showed a real confusion between this distinction, between what it is for a faculty or a group of faculty to speak as faculty governed by academic freedom versus the department, which does not have academic freedom. It's an administrative unit and is functioning as a part of the university and speaking as the university. So I think your emphasis on that distinction is very important for people to bear in mind when they are evaluating, you know, what departments say and who says it. So I think it's extremely important. The other comment I wanted to make, and I just want to see your reflection on it. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the university not taking political stances. What your thoughts are on the action of the regents uh, supporting the proposition which would have rolled back um, affirmative, you know, reinstated affirmative action, which they took an explicit political position on and expressed a view that they took to be not just merely the view of the Board of Regents, but the view of the University of California. Good, good. So I, I'm, I'm glad that that distinction came through. You know, I, I wonder what you think as a member of the uh, Department of Philosophy about the statement I put up there. So there, right at the top of their homepage, it says that the department uh, condemns anti-Asian violence or something like that. Was that meant as a administrative statement or were you as faculty speaking there? Unfortunately, Ryan, I was not at the faculty meeting that made that decision. And so I really don't know what happened. So I apologize <laughs> that I cannot enlighten you on that. Um, I did not actually even recognize the department had made that statement. I'm very curious about it. I don't disagree, <laughs> uh, but um, I don't know what the process was. And I would have preferred it be stated as we, the faculty, the you know, you know, philosophical, philosophical faculty and faculty of philosophy believe this uh, right. rather than the department, which I think was the intent. So I believe right. it did really miss the, the fundamental distinction here. Yeah, and you know, then where the rubber is going to hit the road uh, in terms of any sort of policy is um, something that sounds extraordinarily boring, but really, who has control of websites? Right. Uh, because, of course, the difference between, as you say, an administrative unit speaking versus a faculty speaking uh, gives rise to the question of, okay, then whose statements go at the top of departmental websites? One or the other, potentially both, depending on how the faculty is constituted in that. So what your voting procedures are, what exactly you mean by the faculty of the Department of Philosophy, that, you know, that could be uh, just some part of the faculty, in which case we have the limited public forum issue um, of needing to have viewpoint non-discrimination in terms of access to that, to posting on that department. Again, these seem like hyper-technical lawyerly kinds of concerns, and yet these are the ways we're communicating these messages. And, and um, some of those distinctions are built into the various, you know, uh, various rules and regulations, for example, the Academic Senate, where it defines what constitutes a faculty, who members of the Academic Senate are, for example, and also into various you know, constitutional uh, criteria of the university to what constitutes a department and so on. So some of that is built in, but of course, you, know, you gotta do a lot of reading to understand that. Yeah, yeah. And it's not something within the can of, I think, individual faculty to really understand the distinction between being a member of the faculty and being a member of a department, which are not the same thing. Sure, sure. So uh, to your to your question um, about the regents, you know, of course, the regents have the authority uh, to commit us as university to litigation, mm -hmm. which it may seem that if uh, if they can do that, if we could challenge the constitutionality, say, of uh, a state proposition or of the rescission of DACA under the Trump administration, uh, if we can do that, 
then you might also think we could just speak about those policies, uh, that the greater power there might include the lesser. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, it has traditionally been the case that uh, state referenda are treated much like, uh, you know, regular elections, electing right. a governor or something like that, where it would seem uh, deeply inappropriate, if not <laughs> illegal for the um, for a political branch to be electioneering in any way like that. So, uh, you know, perhaps there is that kind of difference. I will say that, you know, even the University of Chicago with its self-proclaimed, uh, you know, belief in institutional neutrality does make an exception for things that affect the uh, internal affairs of the university. Right. Um, Chicago has spoken on DACA, which yeah. I think is a kind of case at the limit of, uh, you know, of, of what they say they should be neutral on. Right. Well, I think, yeah, because the case of DACA is something which affects the well-being of the students of our community. Well, of course it does. But of course, we also have any number of non-citizen students who are, say, waiting in lines for visas, waiting in line for a more permanent status, uh, where if there was a thinking that um, it's a zero-sum game, which of course it doesn't theoretically have to be, right. uh, you could imagine those people's interests being affected a different way by an, a, a large expansion in DACA or DAPA or some similar program. You know, so that also could affect uh, students within the university. Yeah, well, I mean, this, this Board of Regents in particular with respect to the uh, affirmative action and the SAT have, you know, placed themselves in a very different position than traditionally the Board of Regents of the University of California has placed itself, when it's, played, when it's done taking political actions, it tend to be very reactionary actions. And this has been a very different board in that regard uh, where issues of social justice and the university's stance on these issues have become things which the board thinks it's appropriate for them to take, put the university in a certain position on. And that's very novel for the Board of Regents for the University of California. Which is well, I will, I will just, I'll just say before going to Tom's question very quickly, although we've been fo I've been focused on critiques about how non-neutral position taking could affect internal freedom, uh, academic freedom, freedom to dissent. Of course, there's another external worry, especially at a public university, which is effects it might have on the perceived legitimacy of the institution within the state as a whole. And frankly, a commitment to anti-racism can cut either way on that, because of course, uh, these efforts are precisely done to broaden access uh, to more of the state. And yet, of course, there will also be a part of the state that sees us as uh, captured or beholden to certain uh, you know, political positions here. Sorry. Tom? Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Suchek. Um, I'm kind of with Megan in terms of trying to process it all, but um, you, you spent a good, uh, part of your time talking about departments and, and faculty, um, but I'm less certain or clear about still about the constitutionality, which I didn't really think about until you asked, um, that this is a project that comes out of an administrative unit, right? I mean, I am part of the DEI office. I am participating in helping to create the programming for this. I am not faculty, I'm staff. Like how, what, I mean, I'm, I guess, less clear about how the the ways in which you suggested that a, a department with faculty could support a stance versus something like the vice chancellor's office that is um, purely administrative with, you know, a few faculty appointees. Yeah, those are two very different issues, and you're absolutely right. I hope I didn't elide them too much, but totally different issues. So constitutionally, the hierarchical structure that is the administration uh, means that people within that structure have very limited rights to dissent within the space of their jobs. They certainly do outside of work as citizens, uh, but not within speaking out within your office or something like that is uh, quite limited to constitutional rights. The institution itself, though, uh, falls under what we call the government speech doctrine, which is basically the First Amendment doesn't apply. Uh, to you, you know, we we bring about these governmental structures so that they will act, right? You know, and so 
we have the First Amendment to keep the government from stopping public speech, speech out in public, but we want the government itself to do all sorts of speaking and position taking. The only real limits there come from elsewhere in the Constitution. So, for example, if the University of California said, OK, we can speak, well, we're now a Christian institution. That's obviously going to run afoul of the Establishment Clause. We could run afoul of the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, there are some ways in which the anti-racist project uh, would cause us to run afoul of the Equal Protection Clause as interpreted by the current Supreme Court, uh, which, you know, it has to be said, is a colorblind Supreme Court, is a, is a court that has a strong majority, maybe even a super majority for a colorblind constitution. Um, so those are the limits institutionally. When it comes to the faculty, the real concern is about academic freedom, constitutional uh, protections for academic freedom to speak out against uh, or not necessarily consistent with that university stance. So two quite different sets of constitutional concerns. So I see Professor Socek, we're past five o'clock. Oh. So I wanna thank you so much um, for your presentation. You know, I'm gonna have you on my shoulder, a little you every time I'm writing these quotes for future that's, announcements with a book project. That's project. terrifying. <laughs> 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 well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, as you know, this event was recorded. We'll make the book project, uh, we'll make the uh, recording available on the book project website. And also hoping that folks can join us at our next event. Uh, next Tuesday, October 19th at noon, Karma Waltonen, continuing lecturer in the University Writing Program, will give a talk titled The Language of Social Justice. You can register on the book project website and all are welcome at this free event. And finally, as folks are leaving, we welcome your feedbacks on today's event and invite you to complete a brief survey, which you can access via the QR code or the link listed on your screen. As an incentive and thank you for your participation of the, in the survey, at the end of the survey, you will have the opportunity to enter into a prize drawing for a ticket to see this year's book project featured author, Ibram X. Kendi, at the Mandavi Center on March 31st. So hoping um, that you'll be able to complete that survey and thank you in advance for your participation. Uh, once again, thank you to Professor Socek for your talk today. Thanks to our audience for joining and wishing everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you for having me, Megan.